Do you have to see it to believe it? Are you one who's been known to live by the slogan, I'll believe it when I see it? In Hebrews 11.1, 1, we find the definition of faith. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. We live in a world that demands proof for everything. That which cannot be proven by empirical evidence is suspect. To the contrary, our faith trusts God for what we cannot see. Nevertheless, it is not a blind leap because it is grounded in the character of God. True faith does not demand visual proof, but trusts and obeys the invisible God. On the south side of Highway 52, just about two miles west of the Marion Church, there's a feedlot for a herd of cattle. Most of the time, the cows aren't there, but up over the hill in the pasture. Last Sunday, when we were on our way to church, I commented uh, to, on the cows. Our timing was such that they were strung out in single file along the fence row, walking toward the bunkers where they are usually fed. But as we got closer, I could see there was no food there yet. The farmer had not yet arrived to give them their morning rations. Nevertheless, the cows were in line, waiting to eat. I remarked to Dorothy and the kids, Now that's faith. What did I mean? They couldn't see any feed, yet they were patiently waiting in line. As much as cows can reason through such things, they trusted the person who feeds them, that every day he would faithfully do his job. That's faith. One of the preaching texts I used when I was teaching homiletics at Crossroads College made the distinction between do better preaching versus trust God preaching. Do better preaching has an emphasis on self-help types of activities, while trust God preaching seeks to build one's faith. That's what I'm striving for this morning, and hopefully that's what we seek to do every time we take the pulpit. God is the main character in Scripture, and when we preach from Scripture, we should be building people's trust in Him. Now, as we consider Hebrews 11 and ponder what the author says there, keep in mind the original audience that he is addressing. The recipients of the text appear to have been experiencing persecution. Serving Christ for them was more than an inconvenience. It would be easier, they reasoned, just to forget about him and to return to their roots in Judaism. The thesis of the author throughout the book is this. When you consider all you have in Christ, don't even think about leaving the faith. And then he comes to chapter 11 and he says, As examples, consider the faith of those heroes who were part of the faithful people of God from the past. Life was not easy for them either. They weren't perfect. They didn't have superpowers. In fact, the author's point is to show his original audience and us, all believers in Jesus through the centuries, that we can live exactly the way they did, by faith. Such a life is not just for heroes, which is what we might think if, as we scan across the big names in the early part of that chapter. However, when you come to the end of the chapter, the latter part, the people aren't even named. Many are known only to God, but they too lived and died by faith, and so can we. The author says many things about the nature of faith, but seems to return frequently to the idea that faith is trusting in what we cannot see. In reality, these Old Testament characters died without seeing the fulfillment of the promises of God in Jesus. The dead in Christ since then have also died without seeing the fulfillment of the promises of God relative to the return of Christ and the new heavens and earth. 
However, what we have seen convinces us of the powerful existence and goodness of God so that we trust Him for what we have not seen. In Hebrews 12.1, the faithful, those named and those who remain anonymous, are said to bear testimony to us by their own life experiences that we too can trust in God, that it is worth it to continue placing our trust in Jesus, no matter what the present circumstances might look like. The short version of the story of Noah is found in today's text, Hebrews 11:7. By faith, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, by faith Noah, rather, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. We see the longer version of Noah's story, the full story, in Genesis 6 through 9. As we go back to Genesis, we recognize that conditions in the world of humans during the first few chapters of Genesis are on a downward spiral beginning with sin in Eden. Brother took up weapon against brother, and violence continued to the time of Noah, with a few but very few bright spots. God's perspective as he looked over the whole earth was that wickedness was great. Their thoughts were evil all the time, and he was troubled and regretted that he had made them. Now, why did God not destroy everything in the flood as he had planned and just start over again completely from scratch? We see the answer in Genesis 6, 8, in a simple statement that it would be really easy to miss. Things were bad, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. In his grace, God considered the righteousness of one person, Noah. And Genesis 6, 9 goes on to say, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Oh, that God would say the same about us. We do not know the details of what set Noah apart from the rest of his generation. In general terms, he did what was right. He sought what God required, and we see it clearly in his attitude regarding building the ark. God still planned to destroy creation, but through Noah, he provided a refuge for humans and animals alike. And the ark that Noah built was the first animal rescue shelter. The ark took over a hundred years to build. It was a stupendous structure. Nothing had ever been seen like it before. It was 450 feet long, a football field and a half. It was 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. Now, I know some of you have probably been to the full-size replica ark in northern Kentucky. And if that does nothing else for us, it gives us some idea of what Noah was up against. In addition to building the structure, Noah had to get the animals on the ark, along with the provisions for all of them. God did not ask Moses or Noah to do some small thing, but something preposterous something that was beyond human imagination, apart from the command of God. In addition, God told Noah the reason he wanted him to build the ark was because he was bringing a cataclysmic flood that would cover the whole earth with water, much the way it was before God gathered the waters together to form dry ground on the third day of creation. Now, some of you may know that Dorothy and I live on top of a hill. And at times, since we've lived in Rochester, we've had heavy rain, and some people in our city have experienced flooding. During those incidents, I've had people ask me in casual conversation if we were having any flooding at our house. I humorously remarked, if we were flooded, we're all in big trouble. 
In fact, some surmise that people perhaps had never seen rain before, let alone a flood, since God controlled moisture and humidity by sort of a greenhouse effect prior to the flood. Now, put yourself in Noah's position. God told you, and Scripture says it was unmistakable that God was speaking to him. God told you to build a large boat hundreds of miles from the ocean and to fill it with animals because the earth was about to be flooded above the tallest mountains. God piled one impossible thing on top of another. Would you do it? Or would you say, that's crazy? I've never seen anything like that before. We learn in Hebrews 11 that Noah was awestruck when it came to God. He appreciated God's power. He knew God was God and he was not. And that led him to obedience. His eyes told him none of this was true, but faith told him to do what God said. Not only did Noah have the task of trusting God, he also had the task of warning others who did not trust God because he believed God for what he had never seen. Noah's words and actions condemned the world around him, showing them to be wrong and God to be right. Now, what is the lesson today for you? The Hebrew letter is certainly not setting up an impossibly high standard for us to follow. Rather, it's saying to us, Noah was a righteous man. Noah trusted God. Noah did what God told him. Be like Noah. God made a covenant with Noah. A covenant is when two parties bind themselves together in an agreement. In this case, God set the terms of the agreement. He told Noah what to do, and he told Noah what he would do. Finally, we learn in Genesis 6.22, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. And in 7.2, God declared, I have found you righteous in this generation. According, According to God's command and pattern, The ark became their home for over a year. As we have said, God rescued Noah and his family, along with all the animals, in order to establish a new population that would live by faith in God, following the example of Noah. When they all came out of the ark, Noah thanked God, and God spoke his words of promise to those dwelling on the earth. Never again, will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And the rainbow was given as a sign of the covenant to remind both the Lord and mankind of the everlasting covenant between them. Hebrews 11.7 says Noah's faith made him an heir of righteousness. He acted on the basis of God's command. Apart from the opposition of others, he did what was right because he trusted the one who commanded him. In 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, we see the benefit of the life of faith for Noah and for us. In the ark, a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. The ark was a refuge for Noah and his family and the animals. They were saved from the flood that destroyed all other living creatures because they were willing to listen to God. Peter says baptism likewise saves us as we appeal to God for a good conscience. In other words, it is an act of faith. We cannot see God's forgiveness, but we trust him anyway believing that he is powerful and faithful to do what he says. And so we appeal to him. What was it like in the time of Noah? We can read about their wickedness in Genesis 6, 
But there's more than that. Several times, Scripture refers to the generation of Noah as an example of people who were oblivious to the destruction that was coming. They went on with life as normal, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. And the same is true in our generation. People are oblivious to the ways of God, carrying on with life according to their desires. They refuse to admit to the reality of those things that are unseen. They have to see it to believe it. But Christ has promised he is returning to destroy this earth by fire and with it those who do not live by faith. Even though we have the example of Noah and the flood, there are those today who deny that the worldwide flood ever happened. They are just as oblivious to the works and promises of God as the generation of Noah and other unbelieving generations since his time. How is your faith right now? Things happen that we don't understand. We sometimes think we could manage things better than God. Sometimes in those times of trial, we even turn our back on God because we can't see him at work. He disappoints us by not doing what we think he should do. So we doubt his existence. Keep in mind that the author of Hebrews was addressing the circumstances of his first century audience. Now, I want to turn our thoughts to this audience in front of me here today and to those watching online. What are you facing in this season? Or a better question, how are you facing difficulties in this season? Have you lost your job and been unsuccessful at finding a replacement? Has it caused you to doubt that God can provide for your needs? Are you tired of having your life disturbed by the threat of COVID? Do you think God is not answering your prayers? Have you been diagnosed with cancer or some other troubling illness and living in fear of death? Has a loved one been diagnosed with dementia? Do you feel like God is punishing you or leaving you alone to cope with it by yourself? Is your marriage in trouble and it doesn't seem worth doing what's right? After all, what difference will it make? Are you under a cloud of depression and thinking you'd be better off ending it all? Are you having troubles making friends at school, lonely and feeling like you're invisible? Are you facing surgery with fear because you're, you're sure you're not sure you'll make it and still wonder at times what lies beyond this life? Has all the talk about war and failing finances left you fearful as you face an uncertain future? Is your retirement not turning out to be what you'd hoped? In all of these things, where is God? Too often, if we can't see him at work in our present, we doubt that he will be at work in our future. We blame God, give up on him, and turn our back on him. Why bother with faith? But that's not our only option. There's another way we can approach our current and future problems. We can believe that God will do what he says. We can believe that God is at work in our lives now and for the future, even though we cannot presently see the outcome. We may die before we witness God's work complete, but faith helps us to trust in the faithfulness and power of God. Faith leads us to obey the voice of God. Let's go back to those cows alongside the road. They believed they would be fed if they obeyed and came to that same spot daily. If such animals, by instinct and training, can trust that someone will feed them if they show up, how much more can we trust our loving and powerful Heavenly Father that He will care for us when we trust in Him?
Let's pray together as we close this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you are a Father, a loving Father, who cares for us, who sees beyond our sin, who sees beyond our doubts and fears, and who continues to be faithful to your promises. Lord, help our faith to grow stronger. Help us to trust in those things that we cannot see, to trust you for our future that we cannot see, and to believe that just as you have been faithful in the past, you will be faithful in our, in our present and future. We thank you, Lord, that you have revealed yourself to us, even though at times we believe you to be invisible, that you have shown what you're like, that you have demonstrated your character over and over again. And we thank you that through Jesus, most of all, we can find refuge, that we can be baptized into him and can appeal to you for a clear conscience. We thank you, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And this brings us to a time of communion, a time where we share together with Christ as well as with one another. As you take a moment to prepare the bread and the juice that you'll partake of during this time of the Lord's Supper, I'd like to read a passage of Scripture for you from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. I share this passage with you today because sometimes we get burdened by what we go through in this life. We struggle, we, we get down on ourselves. But when we're suffering because of our relationship with Christ, because we're serving God, but Satan is coming after us, trying to draw us away from God's presence, when we bear those kind of sufferings, we're joining Jesus. We're participating along with him in his sufferings as he went to the cross for his righteous life. Satan wanted him to suffer. He wanted him dead. And he went to the cross. And then unknown to Satan, he bore our sin when he was there to set us free, to draw us into God's presence, to heal the relationship that we had rendered through our sinful nature. And we have come to Christ. We have come through him, come to our Heavenly Father in a healed relationship. And Christ is coming back. He is coming back, and we will see him one day in all of his glory, and we can celebrate in joyful, ecstatic celebration of who Jesus is and of our following him and choosing to live for him with our lives. And so, we shouldn't be surprised by the fiery ordeals that we face. In fact, it's to be expected. Satan is not pleased to have lost control of our lives as we have given control over to the Spirit. And in turn, he attacks us, assaults us, just as he did our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should take heart, in a sense, celebrating that Satan has grouped us with our Lord and Savior by causing us to suffer. Let's pray. Father, it's hard to suffer. It's hard to go through these lives that, that you have blessed us with. It's tough down here. 
We face all sorts of, of pain and struggle. But Father, help us to take heart knowing that in so doing, that we join Jesus in his sufferings as he suffered on our behalf. And Father, we thank you. We thank you for your grace, your love, your compassion in our lives. And we thank you for the sacrifice of Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In this moment, I'd like us to partake of the bread. The, bro the bread that represents Jesus' broken body for each of us. And the juice that represents his shed blood there on the cross that brought us forgiveness, that healed our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Let's pray once more. Father, we thank you. We thank you that, that you give us strength through your Son. We thank you that you have given us your grace through his sacrifice there on the cross. And Father, we celebrate that today. We celebrate that we are able to come to you because of his choice to go to the cross. And Father, we thank you. We pray these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. I thank you for the opportunity to be together with you today and to be able to share the message of Christ with you. I look forward to the next time, either in person in southeast Minnesota at the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ, beginning at 9.30 each Sunday morning, and followed by our worship hour at 10.30. Or, once again, right back here online, as we initially post our message at 11 a.m. each Sunday morning, and then repost it via our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, as well as our website. We look forward to the opportunity to be together with you again and to unfold God's message of love to each of us through his word. God bless and stay well.